Good afternoon, everybody. Before uh, going into our invited uh, plenary speaker today, and uh, while people are still coming in, I have a couple of announcements to do. Uh, one thing is that remember that this afternoon we have uh, the General Assembly, but in the General Assembly is not only a sort of uh, IAS business in, in which all of you anyway are invited because as member of the society we need to have your opinion about many different things. But we also have, uh, we'll uh, give the awards, several awards, and we will have a series of talks uh, that will start with the presidential address, and also we will have the Sorby medalist talk. So please uh, don't leave, uh, stay here, look at the posters, come to the plenary session and listen to these great talks. And then mm, I have a little remarks. We are, of course, very happy that everybody is quite excited about the meeting and want to bring as much as possible out of it. But uh, we have noticed that in many sessions, um, a lot of people take photographs of the slides. As you know, these meetings, like the, the International Congress for the IAS, are great to present new data. And here there are a lot of people that are sharing their data, data with us, but it's data that is unpublished. So we would very much appreciate if, you, if people avoid taking photographs during uh, the presentations. And then last but not least, remember that tonight we have the gala dinner, and there are still some tickets available. Uh, so please stop by the desk uh, if you want to uh, still have one. And for those that, uh, that already have one, uh, it's very easy to get uh, to the dinner place. And if you have any doubts of how to get there, please ask uh, our staff at the, um, at the um, registration desk. And saying this, I will pass then the floor to Judy McKenzie, like as usual, will present our plenary speaker today. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Well, this is our third plenary speaker, and I'm very pleased today to introduce um, uh, Marjorie, Professor Marjorie Chan as our invited plenary speaker for today. Marjorie received her PhD in geology from the University of Wisconsin in Madison in 1982. <clears throat> and she subsequently joined the faculty of the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. She is currently there, still, as a professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics. Marjorie's research interests are in clastic sedimentary geology, and she does multidisciplinary studies using aspects of facies, basin analysis, fluid flow, and modeling. Her research topics have spanned the geological time scale, from Precambrian to the Pleistocene. Her recent graduates connect geology and planetary science to better understand the studies of rock diagenesis and to try to interpret the planet, the red planet Mars. Uh, I always find it interesting uh, to look at acronyms, and uh, the acronym of Marjorie's research group is STAR. What does STAR stand for? Sedimentology and Terrestrial Analog Research. Very good. <laughs> um, this, uh, which, this group studies a large range of sedimentary geology projects covering sedimentology, stratigraphy, and diagenesis. And based on this interdisciplinary approach, uh, sedimentary approach, her group develops analog models which are applicable to subsurface oil and gas exploration as well as to making terrestrial comparisons with planets, the pla in particular the planet Mars. Marjorie has been very active in GSA, the Geological Society of America, and has taken on a number of leadership roles. And she has been the chair of the GSA Diversity Committee, and she is the incoming chair for the um, GSA Sedimentary Geology Group. So she's kind of like on the other side of the Atlantic, an equivalent for what we have here in the International Association. Furthermore, she and her research have been featured on, in many, in, in many uh, television uh, uh, documentaries, 
including some that have been presented in the National Geographic and the Discovery Channels, as well as various videos that she has produced. She was the 2013 guest on National Public Radio, which is one of my favorite <laughs> ways of uh, listening to the news. And uh, I'm sorry I missed that, Marjorie. <laughs> I'll try to find it. Um, and furthermore, she has done, she's also a science advisor for the public broadcasting system, Nova Science Now. Needless to say, Marjorie is very experienced at giving public lectures to a variety of audience of all ages and background. Um, in, her, in fact, she is currently the 2014 Geological Society of America Distinguished International Lecturer. In the last three, and, and she's been giving lectures this year in India, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, and she will be going to Korea afterwards. So I'm really pleased that Marjorie has taken time out of her very busy lecture schedule to join us here in Geneva. And keeping with the, um, the, the, the actual theme of this Congress, which is crossroads of new frontiers in sedimentology, I'm sure we're going to hear some frontier, sedimentology frontiers from Earth to Mars, dune formation, and Diagenesis. Marjorie, please welcome Marjorie Chan. Um, thank you very much for uh, having me at this wonderful uh, Congress, and I'm very thankful to the organizers for inviting me uh, to come. Um, today I want to talk about some sedimentology frontiers, and I think this is really an exciting time for sedimentology. And today, I want to talk about what we think are real frontiers, places that are the uncharted territories that we haven't yet fully explored. And in particular, I want to address three main points. First, I want to talk about some of our perceptions of Mars and how those have changed. Secondly, I want to discuss some of the ways that we use Earth analogs and Earth examples to understand Mars. So I'll talk generally about dune examples and then I'll talk about some of my own research in soft sediment deformation and in diagenesis. And then thirdly, I want to close with what is my opinion of the future of sedimentology. So number one, perceptions. Our perceptions are often based on what data are available to us. And so maybe when we're young and we don't take in a lot of information, our idea of Mars might be something like this. And as we get a little older, and when I was a kid, I thought Martians were like this. Um, and this is from the TV show that was popular at the time. And then maybe even as we get older, and we're teenagers or even into adults, we're fascinated by having more information about Mars and our understanding is deepened so that we might be very intrigued by science fiction. And one of the things that makes science fiction so interesting is that there are those tantalizing possibilities that it could be true, or some parts of it could be true. Now, if you were a geologist in the 1960s, some of your images of Mars look like this. Now, what kind of geology can you do from images like this? You know, today's generation would say, those images are no good, they're too coarse, they're, we need high resolution images. And at that time, that's all that they had. But what's happened is that our uh, data has changed over time. And so what I've done here is I've plotted up the spatial sampling, which you can see on the vertical scale, against the years from about the 1970s up to about the present on the right. And what you can see is that both Earth data that's shown in blue, as well as the Mars data shown in red, has got increasingly higher in resolution. So back in the 70s and so, uh, the resolution was about the size of a house. You could recognize something that was that big. But now the resolution has gotten so good that even from satellite imagery, we can recognize one pixel is equal to 30 centimeters, about the size of a piece of paper. And so that has tremendously affected our interpretations of the planet Mars. And in particular, now the rovers are on the ground and they are getting sub-millimeter resolution. So what this means is that our perceptions have changed from thinking about Mars as being a red planet, maybe mostly basaltic, something like this on the left, to now seeing Mars as a totally different planet, 
a planet that's been influenced by water. And you can see that there are a variety of sedimentary layers. And now suddenly, we as sedimentologists can start to do geology on the red planet like we've never done before. And we can see evidence of past dunes, groundwater, uh, features here that were called blueberries that might indicate past groundwaters. So definitely our perceptions have changed and it really is an exciting era. Now, secondly, I wanted to address how do we use Earth examples to interpret the planet Mars? And I want to focus in on dune systems, which has been one of the areas that I've been researching. You can see these fantastic exposures of cross-bedded sandstones. But really, dunes are, and, and Aeolian systems are more than just a monotonous pile of sand. They're actually quite telling in terms of their stories. And so when we look at Aeolian deposits, some of the things that are important is that, of course, these have applications to very thick, extensive reservoirs. But because these are continental deposits, these are also very good at recording climate signals. We also see from some of these examples that many of these sandstones are very colorful. And many of these colors are reflecting how fluids have moved through the rocks in the geologic past. And so these are recording important records that you often don't get in um, some other types of sedimentary deposits. And then the third aspect of these Aeolian systems is that these can be used as analogs to Mars. When we look at Earth, we can see that many of the Aeolian processes uh, can be imaged from satellites. So you can see these kinds of images here where we can see the dune field. We can see some of the margins of the dunes. And we can compare even these types of satellite imagery to Mars, where we see very similar types of dune features. Some of them can have smaller bed forms on top of larger bed forms. Um, and we can see that the wind processes on Mars are very prevalent right now. We can also see features that look like this, these spirals. And these are evidence of dust devils that are currently, or that have been active in the recent past. And so we see that Mars isn't just a, a cold planet that, that hasn't had much activity, but even today, there are the dynamics of wind that are preserved. And here are some examples of uh, cross-bedded deposits that have been interpreted as dunes. You can see the cross stratification. And so these types of examples that we have from Earth are important to understanding these that you're seeing on Mars. So um, on Mars, we still have yet to answer many different questions. And some of these questions range from what is the source of the sand? Uh, what are some of the ages of the sand? And has the sand been recycled? And what are some of the fluxes? And some of the current studies today indicate that these dunes are in fact moving. And they can estimate some of the rates of movement. Now, I want to move uh, to some Aeolian stories that are from some of my own research. And my research is focused a lot in uh, the state of Utah, shown here in red. And you can see the geologic map shown here. We're very fortunate to be right near the Colorado Plateau, where the rocks are horizontal and, and spectacularly exposed. And I've been looking at examples in both the Permian as well as in the Jurassic, but particularly focusing on the Navajo sandstone. And this Jurassic unit shows examples of soft sediment deformation and diagenesis. So these are the two stories that I'm now going to go into and show you some of the examples of how we might use these to also apply to our understanding of Mars. So starting with soft sediment deformation, in northern Arizona, you can see spectacular exposures like this. And when I saw this, I thought, boy, this is almost like being on another planet. Where can you go to see things um, so well exposed like this? Um, this particular area is called White Pocket. It's just uh, across the Utah border. And from Google Earth images, you can see these kinds of features. You see why it gets its name. You can see the white sandstone here, which is the Navajo. And you can see the enlargement of this particular area here, which is shown on the right. What's kind of unusual about this is that from these satellite images, you can see these ridges. And these ridges are you know, about a dozen or so. They're spaced on the order of tens of meters apart. And these are mounds 
that are oriented perpendicular to the paleo dune flow that would have been to the south southeast. Um, and there are no joints or other fault patterns that are really accounting for these kinds of orientations. Now, we wanted to get a little bit closer, and there didn't seem to be anything between Google Earth images and being the geologist on the ground. So what we decided to do was to use remote-controlled um, airplanes to mount cameras to help us with these studies. And this was at a time before everybody got their GoPro cameras mounted on their quadcopters. Um, and so this was kind of new at the time that we did it. But we found that this could give us a bird's eye view of some of these exposures and be kind of the intermediate between Google Earth and being on the ground. And that particular image, um, that particular perspective was very important to us. So we use these remote controlled airplanes. We also use kites when the wind was very strong. And we use these to kind of help give us a different perspective for our geologic models. We recognize that there are different facies. These facies range from uh, regular cross bedded sandstones that you can see here in these uh, Navajo sandstone cliffs. You can see some of the dune stratification shown here with very colorful diagenetic overprints. Um, but you can see that some very different facies happen here in this Aeolian system. And what happens is that the cross bedded dune sets give rise above it to deformed dune sets. And you can see that some of the angles of the deformation can be actually quite high. Some of them are almost vertical. And these deformed sets are on the order of tens, maybe a tens of meters or so, about 10 meters. And some of these are showing very forceful movement with a lot of internal shears and faults. And then this is overlain by a relatively massive sandstone. And there's not very many times in the geologic record where we get a massive sandstone without any internal structure. But what's notable about this is that it shows a breccia at the base of this massive sandstone. And these have class of the Aeolian laminated sandstone from beneath that have been detached and entrained and captured into this massive sandstone, which I will show you our interpretation of this being a homogenized or liquefied sandstone blanket. So here's some examples of the breccia class. You can see some of these that are red here incorporated in the massive sandstone. You can see some of the remnant lamination that's still preserved where this class might be a meter or two across. The massive sandstone is a little bit like a blanket. And you can see um, a part here where the blanket has been eroded away. But you can see some of these upturned sets here. And you can see that the blanket would have extended across. And you can see some remnants of the breccia shown here. From the uh, remote controlled airplane images, this is what a lot of the landscape looks like. And you can see these spots that are similar to the ridges. And it almost looks like there's a ball or something underneath a blanket sticking up beneath a rug or something. And these, we feel, are some of the places where the crossbed sets are turned up almost on end and sticking up, mantled by this massive sandstone blanket. You can see some of the soft sediment deformation here, which is fairly large scale. And perhaps some of the fine grain sediments that are shown in red here might have been a confining layer that kept some of the pore fluids under pressure uh, before some of the uh, sand above here became liquefied. So this is one of my favorite images uh, showing the scale of the deformation that you could see imaged from the remote controlled airplane. And there are not very many places on Earth that I think you can see this kind of spectacular three-dimensional uh, type of exposure. Here's another example showing the mass of sandstone. And you can see that even this mass of sandstone looks like this is liquefaction-induced ground failure. So the model that we've developed for this large-scale deformation is that in a Aeolian system, there might have been times of a relatively high or shallow water table.
And because of the differences in the height and the weight of these dunes, there was differences in liquefaction resistance. So where the dune pile was relatively small, you would have lower liquefaction resistance. Where the dune thickness is greater, you would have higher liquefaction resistance. And so this actually facilitated lateral spreading and failure of the dunes uh, with strong ground motion. So during a period of strong ground motion, we think that these sedimentary deposits reacted by transitioning to a steady state flow. And this would be the steady state flow here shown by the massive sand blanket uh, in orange. And you can see that during strong ground motion, many of the excess pore fluids would be moving upwards to the areas of low liquefaction resistance, and you would have liquefaction very near the uh, top of the water table with some of these dunes virtually splitting. If you could look at the relationship of strength versus strain, you would see cyclic mobility on the onset of strong ground motion, then getting strain softening flow until you would reach this steady state flow represented by the massive sand blanket. So all of these features that we see, we have attributed to dynamic deformation that's created these mounds of water pressurized sediment spaced on the order of a few tens of meters. When we think about what could be the possible source for this strong ground motion, naturally we think of earthquakes. Uh, we also consider the idea of a bolide impact, but we think this type of deformation would require sustained um, strong ground motion from earthquake types of waves. And from looking at some of the work that's been done in a number of places, um, you can see the moment magnitude of earthquakes plotted here on the vertical axis um, against the distance from the epicenter to the location of liquefaction. Now, during the Jurassic, there was subduction going off towards the west, and probably we were in a position of white pocket being on the order of a few hundreds of kilometers away from the subduction zone. So you can see that this would require um, a very strong earthquake to get this type of deformation, probably something at least on the order of seven to eight and maybe even as high as nine. Um, so perhaps these kinds of examples of soft sediment deformation are giving us records of the times when there's been uh, water, high water tables, as well as strong ground motion. So the analog that I want to leave you with is here is an example of um, our remote controlled airplane photo. And what's very striking is how these compare to some images of Mars that we hope to explore further. You can see some of the very strong similarities, uh, the curvature of the deformation. The scale is a bit larger, but um, this is tantalizing to try to figure out why would these kinds of features also be happening on Mars. So the story of soft sediment deformation tells us that there are good examples of the preservation, and it's showing us different scales uh, from even micro uh, faults and, and offsets to large-scale breccias to the deformation of upturned aeolian sets. And there are different expressions of uh, many of these features that could be considered seismites. In terms of the paleoenvironmental conditions, all of these kinds of expressions are showing us that the sand is highly susceptible to liquefaction and that these records are possible examples of earthquakes that are very strong on Earth and perhaps we can use those examples to further explore the role of water in the sedimentary record of Mars. And I think that this is going to be a new frontier for sedimentology. The other story that I want to tell you about is diagenesis. And um, some of the work that I've done uh, over a decade ago started with trying to figure out what's the relationship between sandstone color and concretions. And why are sandstones different colors? And I think sometimes nature wants to make it easy for us. And so um, we're fortunate that much of the rock record on the Colorado Plateau is color coded. And color coding is good for some of us that are visual uh, learners. So the colors that we're seeing 
are reflecting how the element iron has cycled through the Earth's crust. And you can see some of the different colors here. And even these um, concretions, these cemented mineral masses, are different colors that are reflecting different compositions, different compositions of waters. So we have iron oxide concretions, we have green malachite concretions, and blue azurite concretions. So both the colors of the sandstone, as well as the concretionary forms, are telling us stories about groundwater fluid flow. The model that we um, developed was largely based on uranium roll front types of models. And our idea was that fairly early on in the sedimentary history, probably many sand grains developed a very thin coat or a very thin film of iron oxide, um, perhaps very soon after deposition into early burial. And then as these rocks are buried in the subsurface, certain chemically reducing fluids come through, strip off the iron coats, and put the iron into solution. So that it bleaches the sandstone white. And then when these fluids interact with oxygenated conditions, it causes the precipitation of some of the iron oxides. And it's possible that some of these could be other reduced species of iron uh, concretions such as pyrite or siderite, and then later uh, become oxidized with oxidizing waters. So the model as shown here shows out with a red sandstone. You introduce reducing groundwaters that bleach the sandstone white, strip off the iron films and put the iron into solution. So this is water saturated with Fe2+. And then upon um, mixing with uh, oxygen-rich groundwater, uh, you would precipitate out some of the iron into um, these different forms. Now, the key here is that um, there's probably certainly uh, variations on this model, but we need reducing waters in order to bleach the sandstone and mobilize the iron. And then there might be later stages of oxidation that produce the end product of the iron oxides. There are lots of potential complications. And um, there might be precursor minerals. Many of these sandstone systems are very porous. And so they're open systems. And they exist over long periods of geologic time, maybe tens of millions of years. So there might even be multiple events going on. It's very difficult to know the timing. And certainly, I think that biomediation is probably a very important process in some of these uh, concretions. To show you examples of reducing fluids, you could have a variety of different types. Maybe petroleum is one example. You could have methanes. You could have acid-rich uh, solutions or even organic acids. So here's an example of a red sandstone. And you can see the tar sand right here in the middle that's gray. And then you can see some of these bleach selvages or these bleach sides. And um, even in this interval here, there are concretions that occur here. So this is one potentially reducing uh, type of fluid. Here you can see a rhizolith or a root. And probably the original organic material in that root structure made this a locally reducing environment, even though all of the rest of the area around it uh, was oxidized. Some examples where we see the relationship between the concretions and some of these reducing fluids are in the Permian white rim sandstone. Um, the white rim sandstone gets its name because it's this very prominent ledge former. And you can see that it's very white. And this is a place where this is an exhumed um, tar sand. And you can see the tar literally dripping and oozing out of this Aeolian cross-bedded sandstone. And in some of the areas, we see these iron oxide concretionary masses um, that, are associate, that we feel are associated with the uh, petroleum fluids. Now, what does all of this have to do with Mars? Um, and I kind of asked myself that a long time ago. Um, and I just happened to take a planetary scientist on a field trip um, in 2003. And he said, have you ever thought about concretionary iron as being um, a possible explanation for the uh, hematite on Mars. And I said, you know, I've never even thought about Mars, really. Um, and we started working on that. And in 2003, we had a paper that was in review 
saying that we thought concretionary iron was a good explanation for the hematite on Mars. And at the time, it was very different from the prevailing idea where many people thought that the uh, hematite on Mars would be like banded iron formations. So this was in review before the um, rover actually started sending pictures back in uh, 2004. Um, and so when I show you some of the pictures, you'll be able to see why this was such an exciting moment for us. But the uh, rover Opportunity, um, one of NASA's Mars exploration rovers, was sent here to Meridiana Planum. And this was an area that they knew from some of the spectral imaging had crystalline hematite. And because hematite typically forms in the presence of water, it was um, one of the target areas to see if there might be evidence of life. So from the geologic examples on Earth, we know that iron is often a fluid flow indicator and might have implications for groundwater um, as well as host rock properties and where the waters have flowed. So when the opportunity started sending the pictures back in 2004, um, these were some of the very early images of the Eagle Crater, and this was the landing place here. This is the thermal emission spectroscopy that's superimposed on the outcrop image of the uh, Eagle Crater. And you can see that where it's red, this is high amounts of iron. Where it's white or colorless, this is low amounts of iron. And then these are intermediate amounts of iron. And this is actually where the rover balloon bounced and pushed some of the hematite into the Martian soil. You can see some of the similarities of this kind of distribution with the outcrop. You can see that these are low amounts of iron, similar to this here. And you can see that these areas here would be high amounts of iron, similar to the areas shown in red. Some of the very key um, types of interpretations from some of these images were to be able to see uh, not only the weathered product, uh, which looks something like this on Mars, but also to see the in situ or the in place distribution. Um, from some of the imaging, some of the hematite looked like these features here, and they looked like blueberries. Um, and so uh, if you took the gray color, it kind of might look a little bit like this bluish gray. And also, if you look at the in situ or the in place distribution, this has the false color that's superimposed, but it shows you where the spherules of the hematite are, and they're almost spaced out like blueberries in a muffin. Well, there aren't very many geologic cases where you can get that kind of spacing of uh, class. And so, in essence, we've used the uh, examples of concretions on Earth to help show that the physical spacing and the self-organized distribution is telling us that these are probably features deposited by groundwater and features that we would interpret as concretions, somewhat similar to features on, on, um, on Earth. Some of the keys were to actually look at some of the compositions, and they used the Mossbauer instrument, which, tell, which is a very good iron indicator, and they looked for a place where some of these blueberries had collected in a depression. They called that the blueberry bowl. And you can see that this had a very characteristic six-peak signature of hematite. And when they used the rock abrasion tool to kind of scrape away the outcrop, to see what the interior of these blueberries look like, you can see that it's mostly a, a fairly uniform type of interior. And on Earth, we have examples that are also um, mostly uniform looking, but we also have features that show very complex rinding uh, types of structures. Whenever we use an analog, it's not going to be a perfect one-for-one -one match. And so Mars definitely probably has its own unique conditions with an abundance of iron, and it probably has its unique uh, chemistry. But on Earth, as we're using examples, one of the things I think we have to be careful about is that Earth is literally contaminated with life. And I would also assert that probably on Earth, um, when we look at the sedimentary record, anything since the Precambrian especially, we, we don't even know what abiotic looks like. Um, we haven't had any waters since, you know, very early on in Earth's history that probably haven't had microbes in them. And I think that those elements are very important to consider. So when you look at these kinds of concretions, these are very large that are about the size of grapefruit. Um, 
and this is one you know, chemical reaction front, I believe. Um, maybe these are so big because they're influenced in different ways by some of the biology. To kind of further show, I think, the importance of biology, um, I've been working with a vertebrate paleontologist who's been looking at some of the early evolution of Triassic dinosaurs. And he was looking in some of these quarries in New Mexico. And one of the things that he noticed is that they found certain beds that would have the dinosaur bones. And invariably, where the dinosaur bones were, they would often find concretions associated with those. And in fact, it, the relationship was so good that if they saw concretions, they knew that they were going to find dinosaur bones. And this was really um, a fun uh, story to think about. And as we started looking at this, uh, we found that many of the bones shown here and also shown here actually have the concretions attached to the bones. And not only are they attached to the bones, but oftentimes they're at the ends of the bones. They're right at this end, and you can see one at this end. Now, why would that be? You know, we think that there might have actually been some original organic or connective tissue at the ends of the bones, and maybe there's enough organics there to actually make a nucleation site for some of these types of concretions. And these, in particular, have pyrite, they have uh, oxidized uh, guthite, there's gypsum, um, but these are very clearly associated with the bone beds. And this, again, I think is emphasizing the importance of geology and biology. Um, that, that these uh, two fields are very much interrelated in the geologic record. Some of the new things that we've tried are to use uranium, thorium, helium chronometry in diagenetic oxides. And normally it's very difficult to find materials to do uh, dating, uh, to do absolute dating. But what we've been able to try is to take some of the radiogenic daughters and in particular try to sum up the helium products to actually try to get some idea of some of the ages. And some of the ages um, are promising. Uh, many of the dates are showing a wide range, as old as 25 million years to as young as 0.1 million years. And again, uh, while this is not definitive in terms of a single um, age, it's maybe telling us a story that these diagenetic systems can be very complex. There might be older uh, phases as well as younger, and we still might need to understand what some of the closing temperatures of the helium are. But, but I'm hoping that this will be a method that might be further developed in the future to help us understand uh, diagenetic iron oxides. If I were to look into my own crystal ball into the future, this is probably what it would look like. And this is one of the largest iron oxide um, concretions that I've seen. And I, I think that there's still a lot of work to be done on uh, concretions, and particularly the role of biology. And to kind of give you an idea of the size of that one, my son is standing on it. It's about 82 uh, centimeters in diameter, and it really surprised me how almost perfectly round some of those are, especially given the large size. Um, and I think that many of these might be telling us complex stories of fluid flow. Um, certainly, these kinds of products are telling us about how groundwater has moved through the rocks, and particularly how iron is cycled on Earth, as well as perhaps on Mars. And so one of the frontier areas that I think we might take away is that we might understand better how biology helps mediate diagenetic mineral precipitation. And maybe that's going to have an important role in understanding the potential of biology, not only here on Earth, but also on Mars. Finally, the last topic I want to talk about is, is the future. What's going to happen in the future? Um, because this is about uh, a lot of eolian deposits, I had to say that there are certainly changes in the wind. And so if we look at um, what's going to happen, we can maybe compare some pictures between um, then and now. Um, traditionally, we've been geo like geologists on the left. And I just took this picture uh, more recently um, on the right. And I wanted it to be a picture of a woman, because actually our populations in geology are now very close to 50-50, or even sometimes more. 
Um, but I think all the women were on the outcrop discussing, and, and it was only the, the male that was uh, taking a rest here. But the important thing to think about is, what is the difference in the tools that they're using? You can use your imagination here. Um, so in the old days, we were writing things down, pen in our notebook, uh, taking copious notes and such. But now what's happening is that more of our geologists are using field tablets. And they're doing geology in a totally different way than we've done in the past. And I was just at a field conference where we were trying out some of these new programs. And we were talking with cyber infrastructure people about making voice recognition systems to help us be able to record information so we don't have to sit there and write it down, but it could automatically go into our computer. And I think that this, this might be the wave of the future of how we do geology. Um, in particular, some of the things that are happening is that there's global interest in how we are going to meet the challenge of electronic infrastructure and big data sets and data management. And there is a global effort that's called the Belmont Forum. This involves a variety of countries that are coming together into partnerships to talk about how do we exchange data and how do we actually do a better job of managing data. Some of you have probably heard that a new initiative in the US is called EarthCube. And EarthCube is a, um, an initiative that's been proposed by the National Science Foundation, NSF. And this is to involve all of the sciences related to Earth science, inclu in com including uh, computer and information science. And one of the ideas is that maybe we will be able to come up with something that's like a Google Earth type of platform to actually be the portal to access all our Earth science information, all our Earth science data. And when you think about how much our lives have changed, um, you know, the way we used to access information even 10 years ago is very different than the way we access information now, where we just get on our iPhone and we can instantly pull up information that we didn't have at our fingertips before. So one of the goals of EarthCube is to integrate information and data across the geosciences. And that one of the goals will be that it will allow us to transform the way we do research, in part because we can spend more time doing science and less time trying to find information. And we'll be able to just get some of the information at a particular locality. We'll know who collected a sample there uh, over the last 100 years. Um, we'll know, know the exact GPS locality. We'll know who published on these areas, who's doing you know, isotope analysis or whatever. Um, and this really might change our whole science and maybe open up avenues for new science. So one of the things that I've been doing is collaborating with uh, people from NASA. And one of the things that I've been impressed with is that NASA also wanted to have a, a main portal for uh, data access. And one of my colleagues has developed the lunar mapping and modeling uh, portal. So again, this isn't making a master data plan of uh, or a standardization of all data. What it's doing is creating a portal so that you can access all the information. And this is information from the moon. Um, this particular platform is a geospatial type of platform, and it's been developed so that it could possibly extend to other planetary bodies. So I'm going to run a little short video, um, and what you'll see is that the moon is limited in data. The moon has only got data for the last 40 or so years. But a program like this will allow you to have different types of projections where you can pan in and zoom. And you know, again, this is just for the moon, but it shows you the potential. You can look at different projections. You can uh, look at all the data. These are organized with respect to some of the different missions. You'll be able to look at different instruments and what kind of data they took. You'll be able to compare between data sets. And so an ex as an example, you can look at the iron mineralogy and you'll be able to overlay um, and you'll be able to use a transparency screen so that you can see what's the relationship between the mineralogy concentration and my uh, ground underneath or my geology underneath. So these are some other examples that would allow you to browse uh, through different types of data sets. Um, you can, 
see that you can zoom into uh, different areas. Um, you'll be able to uh, see what the metadata are. Where did that data come from? What are the sources um, of publications that it came from? You'll be able to do um, searches across multiple data products. So here's where they type in the name of a crater, and you can go to that particular example. You can get its dimensions, it'll have the lat long, um, it'll have a lot of different information that you have accessible by using certain pull-down menus. So here's another example using Hadley Mons. Um, and you can see that you can zoom in uh, to this particular area. You can use a marker tool and say, I want to draw a cross section from here to here. And this one will show elevation. It'll just automatically calculate it. You can see the elevation generated here for that particular cross section. And maybe in the future, it will give us the subsurface geology. You could also look at some of the other kinds of features here. They looked at hazards, slope, lighting. Um, these are some of the different results from data sets, but you could visualize data with different kinds of colors. This one shows an example of hazard analysis. And then this one shows an example of using the lighting analysis to estimate uh, solar energy. Now this was a very quick overview, but some of it is just to show you some of the potential, and this is a fairly small data set. So you can also maybe even have a terrain viewer so that you can literally fly by some of these um, spatial areas and you can get different perspectives. Um, and I think the potential for this is just really exciting. What if we had this for all of the earth science data? Um, maybe even a classroom, you could pull up data sets that had never really been compared before because you didn't have the capability or the platform to do it. So uh, to summarize, um, I hope that you uh, received my message that we've got some great examples of dunes, deformation, and diagenesis that, that here on Earth are things that we're going to use to help interpret the sedimentology and we're going to use as analogs to understanding Mars. And secondly, Mars really is a rich frontier. It really is an uncharted territory, an area that has many explorations left for us. And because there, we're finding so many sedimentary rocks, I think it's really going to be great for sedimentology. And so this is an, a time when both Earth and planetary science are coming together in ways that haven't happened in the past. And then finally, I, I hope there are some students here I think the future for you is really exciting. You're on the cusp of new technology, you are the next generation, and you're gonna have the opportunity to do things that our generation never thought were possible. And so as you go out uh, into the future, next generation, you're gonna have a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marjorie, for such an enlightening uh, talk where you, you have amalgamated a lot of different aspects of sedimentology that are really in, in, the, in the spirit of our meeting this year, that is, it was frontiers uh, for the future in sedimentology. So thank you very much. I'm wondering whether there are, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, but some urgent questions that would like to ask Marjorie right now? Can you see? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, there is one in the back. Can you? Uh, assuming in 2020 we're actually able to create a sample cache and somehow try to get it back to Earth, are there any plans uh, to? to bring anything like those blueberries back, um, as far as you know. Um, I, I don't know, but I certainly hope so. I know that there are some that do want to bring some back. And some of the new finds of um, Curiosity are actually finding other types of nodules. And in fact, they found nodules that seem to be different compositions, not just the hematite. And so one of the things that's uh, really been 
uh, coming to the forefront is that we're seeing that there's different mineralogies that represent different conditions. So the hematite seems to represent acid types of conditions, low pH waters, but some of the things like the carbonates and the clays that they're finding are in indicating circumneutral pHs. And so we're seeing that there's probably been multiple water compositions on Mars, and I think you know, one of the goals is to bring back multiple rock types that will represent those uh, different compositions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for this uh, fascinating talk. Uh, makes me want to go to March next summer. But uh, uh, I've got a. Oh, it wasn't working before. Yes, it, it does. Was, oh, okay, okay. Um, you you said uh, that those uh, sort of structures um, in Utah and on March, uh, as well as the uh, those concretion of uh, iron, uh, were uh, signs of maybe groundwater. Uh, activity. Now you, you also said in the, the diagram that you thought the, um, the precipitation of hematite uh, was um, uh, the result of uh, oxygenated groundwater. Now if that's true, and I'm sure it's true in, on the Earth, how do you explain the, the presence of oxygen in groundwater on March? Yeah. How, do you pre, uh, how do you create that oxygen? Since those oxygenated conditions. Um, people have told me that uh, it doesn't take a lot of oxygen and that maybe even on Mars um, there's enough oxygen to have oxygenated it so that you could make the hematite. Um, the other issue is that many of these deposits are fairly old in the Mars history. I mean, some of these are maybe uh, a billion, two billion years old. And so, um, that doesn't mean that you know, the way the uh, atmospheric conditions are now is the way that they were in the past. And it does seem like a lot of evidence of water has been in the past, even though the conditions today don't, show, don't seem to show surface water. So uh, these are things that we still don't know, and I think that it's still some of the uncharted territory uh, for, for people to explore. Um, but certainly one idea is that, that those were conditions in the past and maybe the conditions now are different. Does that answer your question? Uh, um, I'm not sure. No, uh, well, basically, how do you create the, the oxygen? Are we talking about you know, O2 uh, gas in, in, in the atmosphere? How, how do you produce? Because on, on Earth, what I learned at, at school was that the, the only way we, um, we understood was that there, there were bacteria that were producing uh, O2 through um, um, photo, photosynthesis. Yeah. So how do you get oxygen without photosynthesis? How do you get oxygen without animals or, or biology? Without, yeah, without plants. Um, I don't, I'm not really qualified to answer that. Oh, so, so sorry. <laughs> but, you know, I'm a sedimentologist like you. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think people are looking at all these, these different types of models and um, you know, some people are wondering how much the atmosphere has changed, and it does seem like there, there was water, you know, in the past. And in fact, they see uh, large outflow channels, they see river systems, they see things that look like past alluvial fans. And so if there's water, there's, there would have been oxygen. Um, but I don't know if, if it's, an, you know, how much you need to, to do all of these uh, different reactions, but I, th I think there is enough. I'm sorry, I can't tell you anymore. I wish I could. Okay. Um, I suggest we will have now, uh, before the um, General Assembly, we will have a, a poster session. So Marjorie will be around as well as tomorrow. So if you have questions that you would like to ask her directly about certain aspects of her presentation, I'm sure she will be happy to answer. So before thanking her again, remember to come back to the next talks of the uh, Sorby Medal and the Presidential Address. Thank you very much. <laughs>